Um, we've looked at a number, of, well, we've looked mostly at the Cuban Missile Crisis and the destabilizing effect that that can be considered to have had. I'm going to try and look at uh, a different source of uh, potential instability, much more prosaic. And it's my central assumption that, that little could be more destabilizing for, for British, NATO, or European defense policies than for Britain to unilaterally relinquish the nuclear deterrent, especially through parliamentary hesitation, perhaps as the result of a vociferous minority. So what I'm going to look at this morning is uh, the story of opposition to, to nuclear deterrence in Britain from the start of the CND in about 1958 through to the, uh, the general election of 1964, very much from the public domain and the way the public interacts with that. And I'm going to seek to identify any lessons salient for, say, the next five years. The first British government, or mo most of the British public, rather, knew of the atomic bomb was the initial report of the bombing of Hiroshima. And the Times headline on page four was first atomic bomb hits Japan, explosion equal to 20,000 tons of TNT. The remainder of the article includes a verbatim account of the Prime Minister's speech to the Commons. There was no speculation, there was no expert critique, there was no catchy headline, and there were no antagonistic interview dramas. Subsequently, Clement Attlee's government continued independently with the development of a British atomic bomb, and it was only in 1948 that the Defence Secretary actually announced that to the House. Media coverage the next day was almost non-existent. With the delivery of the first Blue Danube bomb to RAF Wittering in 1953 and the first frontline bombers in 56, Britain had an operational atomic force, again with very little domestic debate. That's not, of course, the last time that we're planning to deploy an airborne capability in two halves separated by years. The, uh, the 1957 Wreath Lecture, uh, the series, was entitled Russia, the Atom and the West, and it was delivered by George Kennan, the ex-US ambassador to Moscow. It was an examination of the contemporary strategic factors, and with any complex argument, the points that Kennan made were deeply nuanced and interrelated. But the public was able to listen to the whole series and make up their own minds, fully informed of all of the points in the debate. At about that time, the cuckoo in the nest of do, uh, domestic politics, if you like, or uh, public opinion, was television. And in March 1958, the Home Secretary, Rab Butler, appeared on the BBC's new flagship current affairs series, Panorama. And he was discussing the Soviet nuclear testing with, as the Times put it, five accomplished controversialists who bitterly opposed the government's basing of defense policies on big bombs. So already, about a year in, television was portraying serious, complex issues in a manner designed as much to promote uh, dramatic argument on camera, if you like, as to elicit public understanding of the points of the debate. Again, roughly the same time, what became the campaign of nucle for nuclear disarmament emerged from the coalescence of a number of smaller regional groups, mostly those that were actually opposed to nuclear testing. This peace movement was lent momentum by the Suez Crisis, the invasion of Hungary, and the launch of Sputnik. It was then given focus by Sands Defence Review in 1957, which announced that Britain would adopt a defence policy underpinned by nuclear weapons. And after an abortive attempt to disrupt the first British H-bomb test, the Direct Action Committee established an objective of non-violent civil disobedience. And their first national project was a march from London to Aldermaston, planned for Easter 1958. Now, from the birth of CND, there has been a tension between many of the rank and file and the DAC, who saw the movement as essentially an extra parliamentary one, and the executive of CND, which was convinced of the need to influence political process through the conversion of the Labour Party to a unilateral disarmament position. And of course, they succeeded. The Labour Party Conference of 1960 adopted a resolution supporting unilateral nuclear disarmament, which was driven through by six of the largest trade unions against vehement opposition from the leadership and the constituencies. Gateskill argued, I'm going to quote this because I, I, I want to make a point about it later. What sort of people do you think we are? Do you think we can simply accept a decision of this kind? Do you think that we can become overnight the pacifists, unilateralists, and fellow travelers that other people are? With concerted effort on the part of the Labour Party National Executive, the vote was reversed the following year. And ironically, that defeat in Scarborough, or perhaps, more accurately, that bravura speech during the debate, actually strengthened Gateskill's leadership position. And his overwhelming victory against Wilson in the ensuing leadership contest prevented the more left-wing, pro-disarmament lobby from attaining executive power prior to the 1964 general election. And Wilson did not come out of Scarborough very well either. One conference magazine recorded, 
If the Labour Party ends this week facing in two directions, it's certain that the figure of Mr Wilson will be there at the end of both of them. Gaitskill's authoritative leadership ensured that the Labour Party did not fight the 1964 election from a unilateralist stance. He died in 1963, and Wilson did succeed him, but the party policy going into the 1964 election was specifically not unilateralist, and Wilson proceeded to deploy Polaris in accordance with the Polaris Sales Agreement, which had been signed by Macmillan the previous year. What would have happened had Labour fought that election on a unilateralist stance is anyone's guess. In 1958, in April, the 4,000 anti-nuclear demonstrators met in Trafalgar Square and marched to Aldermaston in an event organised by the DAC and blessed by the CND. In 1959, 20,000 were at Trafalgar Square to meet the end of the march from Aldermaston. In 1960, it was between 30 and 100,000, depending on whose estimates you believe. The Berlin crisis of uh, June to November 1961 raised international tension significantly. And when both the USA and the USSR resumed nuclear testing right in the middle of it, they lent the disarmament argument a real air of urgency. This really was the era of the four-minute warning. I think we've covered the Cuban Missile Crisis, but my point is with the immediate hindsight, both of those crises seem to suggest that deterrence actually works, since the superpowers were seen to back away from the brink. And Quite clearly, the compelling urgency that had given such an edge to the CND campaign in 1960 to 61, 62, ebbed. So much so that by the time of the general election in 1964, CND was virtually a spent force. And although set piece events, such as the Aldermaston marches, seized the popular imagination at the time, their impact on opinion wasn't long lived, nor was there much political momentum generated, and the movement failed to turn it into a coherent political force. Now, in that period, radio and Newspapers were the, uh, were the primary media, with television catching up fast. The general public had ready access to first-class analysis of the nuclear debate and coverage in the establishment press, and I've used the Times a couple of times as, a, as an exemplar, was of a standard and objectivity and considered thought that, to be frank, is rarely seen in the 21st century. There were no Lib Dems hunt for a tuppenny trident headlines here. Kennan's Reith lectures presented a balanced and rational assessment of the factors relating to the deployment of nuclear weapons that one would struggle to identify anywhere today, except maybe here. So what did what we learn or what have I learned over about 1964? Well, the public were as well informed as they cared to be, and the media provided well-balanced, in-depth analyses of all of the in issues involved. CND very nearly managed to convert the Labour Party to a unilateralist stance, and as I said, whether Labour would have been elected in 1964 on that platform or not is just counterfactual speculation. Macmillan's government and Gateskill's Labour Party appear to be caught completely unaware by the CND's activity and seem to have been constantly responsive rather than proactive. Well, so what? Well, times have changed now. Robin Cook was quite clear about what he thought of media coverage of political issues. I'm quoting him. From breakfast with John Humphreys to bedtime with Jeremy Paxman, the public are served up interviews on political issues that often appear designed more to produce studio drama than to inform their audience. Reducing every political interview to a one-dimensional confrontation suppresses any chance of an honest and balanced discussion of the real dilemma. So despite modern media, or maybe because of them, the public has less ready access to objective commentary on complex policy issues. Post-Cold War, with the threat of attack much less salient, the case for Britain remaining a, a nuclear weapon state is much less obvious to the public. It's very easy to condemn in simplest emotive rhetoric, which plays and exploits the very nature of the modern media in the drama of which Cook despaired. Anti-nuclear opposition is gathering and preparing, and it has learnt from its, its failures in the 1960s and 80s. And the next government has a lot to do if it wants to sustain the UK's deterrent. If the government is committed to Britain remaining a nuclear weapon state, it will face the most articulate and agile single-issue opposition it has ever faced. It needs to be preparing now to provide the focused and authoritative leadership shown by Gateskill 50 years ago, or it's going to be caught out by the completely expected.